Okay, I think we're pretty much in here tonight. So thank you for coming again. Um, my name is Rhoda Kana, and I'm the health ministries leader here at the Greenville Seventh-day Adventist Church. And um, I'd just like to, to tell you about our next dinner with the doctor. I always have them scheduled so that you know for the next time. <clears throat> but I want to ask first, did you guys enjoy the supper? Yes. Good. Do you think you might make those recipes at home? Yes. Good, good. Very good. Okay, so our next dinner with the doctor will be on April uh, 11. And I know you all got a little card when you came in, but um, it's on vibrant skin. Presented by Dr. Phil Mills, and he comes to us from the College Dale area. He's a dermatologist there, and he's agreed to come here and talk to us about op obtaining vibrant skin. You know, skin is one of the largest organs in your body, right? Because it covers your whole being. So mark your calendar and uh, come t on April 11 to hear Dr. Phil Mills. Any questions about the recipes? Pretty straightforward? Okay, just come see me later if you have any questions about them and I'll be happy to, to answer them for you. <clears throat> so let's go ahead and begin. I'm doing the devotional tonight and um, in this devotional, I'd like to tell you a story, okay? So this story takes place almost 20 years ago, west of Chicago, Illinois, at the Naperville Central High School, a school district that boasts 19,000 students. Can you imagine? It's a lot of students. In this high school were freshmen students that were required to take a literacy class to bring their reading comprehension up to par. And part of this freshman group volunteered to participate in an experimental gym class. This was no ordinary gym class called Zero Hour PE. This class was scheduled before the first period of the school day, so bright and early. Participants in zero hour exercised at a higher intensity than other students in regular PE classes, and they were required to stay between 80 to 90% of their maximum heart rate. So you know they were working out. The objectives of zero hour was to determine whether working out before school gives students a boost in reading ability and in the rest of their subjects. <clears throat> Emerging research was supporting this idea. Physical ex exercise sparks biological changes that encourage brain cells to bind to one another. For the brain to learn, these connections must be made. They reflect the brain's fundamental ability to adapt to challenges. The more neuroscientists discover about this process, the clearer it becomes that exercise provides an unparalleled stimulus creating an environment in which the brain is ready, willing, and able to learn. Aerobic activity has a dramatic effect on adaptation regarding sy symptoms that might be out of balance and optimizing those that are not. So it's an indispensable tool for anyone who wants to reach his or her full potential. So at the end of the semester, the student participates in zero, the students that participated in zero hour PE showed a 17% improvement in reading and comprehension compared with a 10 to 7% improvement among other literacy students who opted to sleep in and take standard PE classes. It became evident that hardest subjects scheduled immediately after gym class capitalized on the beneficial effects of exercise. <clears throat> the administration of Naperville Central High School was so impressed with the results 
that it incorporated zero hour into the high school curriculum. And in 2005, Naperville Central High School composite ACT score for the graduating class was 24.8, well above the Illinois state average of 20.1. Is that impressive? <coughs> our, entire, <coughs> our entire body and body symptoms, system excuse me, benefit from activity. And I, do, I know that Dr. Kamineski tonight will certainly motivate us and tell us why it's important to move. In fact, we were created to move. The Bible says that it is in Jesus that we live and move and have our being, Acts 17, 28. When Adam, when Adam and Eve were created, God gave them a job to do, even in, in a perfect world. Genesis 2.15 tells us that God placed Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden and instructed them to work it and keep it. Living in a sinful world, it's, it's hard to comprehend what working in a perfect garden might be like. It wouldn't seem like there would be much to do, yet we are told that they were to work the garden and keep it. And while living among mankind, we know that Jesus walked from village to village. He didn't ride mules or camels wherever he needed to go. The Bible tells us he walked. So it is my prayer that you will put your footprints into the footprints that Jesus left for us to follow. We do that by studying his word and copying his life. Colossians 2, 6 says, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. In other words, if you've accepted Jesus into your heart, conduct your life after him. So let's have prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for your words, and we pray that you will help us to love you as... Um, because Jesus has first loved us. May we respond to that love by obeying him and by walking in his footsteps. Again, we pray for your Holy Spirit to be here with us tonight as we learn. I pray that you will be with um, Dr. Kemineski as he presents to us, and uh, may we be truly blessed by what we learn and then give us the power and the strength to put into practice what we need to know and to do. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So I'd like to introduce our speaker tonight. Currently, he is the wellness health coach and disease management specialist, diabetes health coach for Ballad Health. His role there is to help in employee wellness, employee di diabetes management, and community post-COVID care. So prior to this, he worked in administration positions for Avenus Health Systems at Tacoma Regional Hospital right here in Greenville and Florida Hospital in Zephyr Hills, Florida. While at Zephyr Hills, Dr. Kamineski directed the development of an inpatient and outpatient lifestyle development program called the Wellness Challenge and developed and published the program, a program called 12 Weeks to Wellness. Dr. Kamineski has also been in education, and he taught at Southern Adventist University. Um, he taught lifestyle classes, lifetime, lifetime activity classes, and nutrition classes to the nursing students. Dr. Kamineski received his postgraduate degree in health administration from Tampa University in Tampa, Florida in 1996. And prior to that, he attended college at Atlantic Union College in South Lancaster, Massachusetts, and Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah for graduate school. So we thank you for coming and presenting to us tonight. Can you all hear me all right? All right, it's a pleasure to be here um, with you tonight. I'm so thankful that so many of you showed up. Um, when the top of, topic of exercise comes up, people usually shy away from that. Um, so I wanna clap for you and thank you for coming. Um, what I'd like to do tonight is um, 
spend some time with you talking about why we are where, we're our, where we are as a nation, um, give you some data on that, and then talk about the benefits of exercise, um, follow that up with um, how I think exercise should be done, um, and there's a wide variety of ways to do that. Um, and then I'll end up um, demonstrating a couple of things to you. Um, and I want to start off by basically saying there's no really right way or wrong way. Um, I will say from the very beginning that um, if you have questions, just raise your hand. I'll answer those as we go along. Um, I, you know, if the questions involve um, exercise prescription for a certain ailment that you have, um, I'd rather shy away from that here tonight um, and speak in general terms about exercise um, with one statement, and that is basically that when you do exercise, um, there are a couple of things that you ought to consider. Um, and I could tell you, go see your doctor and um, let them know what you're going to be doing. And I think that's a wise thing for the most part. Um, but I also am hesitant in saying that because as we... Um, tell people to go see their doctor, what are we telling them? We're basically telling them that exercise could be dangerous. Okay? And you don't drive down the street and see a lot of people lying on the side of the road that have been walking. And uh, It's rare that a person will have any type of event when they're exercising, providing they do it judiciously. That they start slow and they build up to where they're, um, you know, walking at a, a regular rate of speed, and we'll talk about that. Um, and that's a key point. Um, I talk to diabetics every day. Um, I talk to people with COVID or that have had uh, COVID and they're going through the post-COVID um, time period. Um, and I encourage exercise. Um, exercise is safe as long as you do it the right way. Um, and as you see when we go through the lecture tonight, there's a lot of different ways to do that. I have a ton of slides. I'm going to be whipping through those things pretty fast. If I'm going too fast, yell at me. Just say, slow down, okay? Um, the title of tonight's talk is on activity, the one of medication. Um, we don't even begin to realize what exercise can do from us from a physiological standpoint and from a spiritual standpoint. And we'll kind of mention that as we go along here. It's been said that kids learn from imitation. How do you think adults learn? You nailed it. Adults learn from crisis. Okay, I've worked in the healthcare system for most of my life. Um, and what I see are people that have made poor decisions along the way, okay? Um, and there's a couple of slides here. I want you to remember as we go through tonight's talk and, and relate them back to what I have to say. Um, and I've mentioned already, you should exercise within your tolerance. If you have a bad back, you're not gonna do something that's gonna exacerbate that or make it worse. Okay, so you need to be careful. And those are the times that you need to see your doctor before you start an exercise program to make sure what you're going to be doing is safe. Uh, we, we consider walking a relatively safe activity and maybe one of the better activities we can do. Um, but there's certain ways we can walk too that might be beneficial that you haven't really considered. Um, I look at the group that's here tonight. Uh, most of us are 50 and older, somewhere between 50 and 60. Um, and so we want to be careful that we don't overdo and ruin a good thing, all right? So we're gonna exercise within our tolerance, check on our doctor. Um, if you have a physical therapist, a physical therapist is a good person to talk to. Physical therapy people know a lot about exercise. Um, they know a lot about body systems and so forth, um, and safe way to do things. Um, so I'll leave that um, with you. It's been said that genetics load the gun, and lifestyle pulls the trigger, okay? Um, think about that for a minute. Lifestyle loads the gun. In other words, what we do every day 
has a lot to do with what's going to happen later on. Okay, and we don't want to be in a situation where we're invalids, we can't um, exercise or, or move about freely. Um, and if we are, um, I hope that as I talk tonight, um, I, I shed some hope for you, okay? So I exercise. Um, I used to have a, a bulletin board in my office uh, when I was down in Florida that said 101 reasons why we should exercise. And these are just a few. Um, can you see that okay? Okay. Um, I'm going to, as I say, I've got so many slides. I want to run through them quick. Most of the information on some of these slides are information that you've either seen or I don't need to be telling you about it. You already know it. Okay. Um, so I'll just pop on a couple ones that I feel are important. Increased respiratory, cardiorespiratory efficiency, that's heart lung efficiency. Um, at the stage you're at in your exercise program or in your non-exercise program, um, there are things that you can do where you're at that you're not gonna be able to do that somebody your age that is in really good physical shape can do. Okay, but you can still gain benefit from a simple walk, as long as you're consistent with that. Um, it gives you stronger, mu uh, stronger muscular strength and endurance. It improves self-esteem, and I could tell you stories about that. Um, improved brain function. We're gonna spend a little bit of time talking about brain function as it relates to um, exercise. Um, it decreases stress. We live in a world today um, where depression, anxiety, uh, and stress are just off the charts. Um, I work with Ballot Health employees on health. Um, I get to see their health records. And um, the percentage of people that are taking medication for depression would stun you. Okay? It's not 10%, it's not 20%, it's not 30%, it's higher. Okay? Think about that. And it's due basically to the world we live in. So what can we do about that? Is there anything we can do about it? I think you'll find that as we talk tonight, um, there is some hope. Um, it increases the quality of sleep. Um, and one of the things I learned as I was preparing for this, and I kind of knew it before, but um, it can make you look younger. Because exercise increases your circulatory system and your vascularization. And so your face can actually become younger looking and those wrinkles can go away without that real expensive cream that doesn't work and only lasts a week or two, <laughs> okay? Um, and there's many, many more reasons there. It improves balance and coordination, um, and we're gonna talk some about that too. I think one of the neat neatest reasons is that exercise literally clears the mind and refreshes the frontal lobe. And what takes place in the frontal lobe? This is where decision-making is um, done. Okay, so if the frontal lobe is refreshed, that means we're better able to make um, good decisions. Activity enhances our immune system. While one sleeps, the brain is bathed in lymphatic fluid to eliminate waste. This is very similar to the um, lymphatic system that takes waste out of the body. Uh, the lymphatic system is a relatively new um, found thing um, back in about 2012, um, a doctor kind of began to do a little bit of research on that and uh, found out there was a system that actually washes the brain because the brain is in a, um, a barrier that things can't get in and get out, which is a good thing because if disease got into the brain, we'd have some real big issues. Um, so glymphatic fluid helps eliminate waste from the brain. Um, as I say, it's part of the lymphatic system. A major portion of the washing occurs prior to midnight. So that's another reason why when you consider sleep, and I know there's sleep issues with many of you probably, but the earlier you can get to bed at night, the better for you. The sleep before midnight is, um, they say, is for every hour of sleep before midnight, it's worth two hours after midnight. Exercise and diet play a key role in helping to keep our communication pathways open so that the Holy Spirit can speak to us. And I believe that that's a really important thing. Um, 
I don't need that exercise stuff. I cross the pain, pain threshold just getting out of bed in the morning. I think a lot of people probably feel that way sometimes. It doesn't have to be that way. <coughs> I want you to really zero in on this slide. I would say out of a lot of the slides that I talk about tonight, this one sends a clear message. Um, even though the data was from 2008, I don't believe it's changed a whole lot. This is the percent of selected chronic diseases that are lifestyle related and possibly avoidable. Look at diabetes. That says basically that 90 to 92% of diabetes is lifestyle related and is avoidable. And I know we have a lot of diabetics maybe here tonight um, just because I know the numbers for diabetes and that's the case, okay? That doesn't mean that you shouldn't be exercising. As a matter of fact, you'll find out here as we talk, exercise is probably one of the best things you can do. <coughs> Excuse me, exercise is like insulin. Insulin gets blood sugar out of the blood and into the cell where it can be used for energy. Um, and so when you exercise, it pushes the blood sugar from the blood vessels into the cell. Um, and that's a very positive thing. Uh, we'll see some data on that. Look at heart disease, 80 to 82% lifestyle related. Stroke, 70%, and various forms of cancer around 70, 72%. So lifestyle does play a key role in how healthy we are. Um, so you should be asking yourself right this minute, or hopefully you're at least thinking about it, what is it that I'm doing or not doing that has an effect on how healthy I am? Okay. Um, anyway, the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System uh, was started by the Center for Disease Control um, back in the mid-'80s. And I know many of you have seen these slides. I've taken out a bunch of them. I'm going to go from uh, in five-year periods to show you um, what's happened to our country as far as obesity is concerned. Um, back in 1985, um, you can see the blue colors there. Those are states that had obesity rates of 10 to 14 percent. 1985, all right? Um, the white that you see there, um, here and here, were states that were not reporting yet. This was relatively new in 1985. Um, then we go to 1995, and all of a sudden we've got this dark blue color and some of that lighter blue color. The dark blue color is now instead of being below 15% average, those states are 15 to 20%. So we've increased 5% just in a short period of time. Now look what happens in the year 2000. This was 15 years after this began. Um, those yellow states are greater than 20%. So we've gone from below 15 to greater than 20. 2005, we've got one state now, uh, actually two states, um, Louisiana, Mississippi, um, that are greater than 30%. That means 30% of their population are overweight or obese. Let's go to um, 2010. You can see that dark red color spreading. Okay, remember this all started when states were below 15 percent. Now half a third of the country is over 30 percent and the news doesn't get any better. Here are the obesity rates um, continuing to rise, and the data is always behind where we are today. This is 2017-18. 42% um, in the United States, overweight, obese, okay? That's catastrophic. That's super expensive, okay? And it's expensive for all of us. If we look at the state of Tennessee, the obesity rate in 2018 was 35%. What do you think has happened since we've had COVID? Think about it. Everybody's home in front of the TV. The workers are sent to, um, home. Um, and so access to our refrigerators are 
It's like free game, all right? I don't have um, the data for 2000, well, I do, kind of. Um, no, I don't. I don't have the data for um, 2022 yet. It, has, it hasn't come out. Um, but I can guarantee that if Tennessee was 35 in 2018, it's probably closer to 40 now. And when you saw the bright red states, where were those located? <laughs> in the south, okay? There's a lot of reasons for that. Um, poverty level, um, access to food, uh, lack of activity, um, tobacco. I mean, there's just a lot of reasons for that. Okay, William Cross, MD from Duke University writes, failing to prescribe exercise to patients with diabetes is simply an acceptable practice. Diabetes and exercise are so critical. Exercise, as I said, plays an important role in what happens to um, blood sugar in the blood vessel and uh, its relationship to inside the cell. Lack of physical exercise is one of the strongest predictors of type 2 diabetes. Many studies have shown a protective effect of physical activity, and the protection appears to be stronger in those at higher risk, individuals who are obese and have a strong family history. So what's the most dangerous thing you can do all day? <laughs> it's it. <laughs> you did well on that one. Scientists at Pennington Biomedical Research Center studied over 17,000, so this is a good study, men and women over a 13-year period and found that individuals who sit most of the day are 54% more likely to die of a heart attack. Okay, let's go back to the COVID thing. What are we doing today? Sitting, okay. I know, I, I sit, um, I work a 10-hour day, I'm um, doing health coaching and stuff, which is kind of an oxymoron. Um, but I sit 10 hours a day at the phone and at my computer. I am, a, I am able to get up and walk some. Um, so it's critical for me to make sure I get some exercise in the morning um, and maybe even in the evening too. Hey, we have one of those. You hang your laundry on it. <laughs> <laughs> How many of you have ever bought a piece of exercise equipment that ended up in the attic? I remember the first piece I bought. Um, I bought it for, I found it in a magazine, and it was, and <laughs> maybe some of you have bought one of these things. You attach this thing to your doorknob, with the door closed, and it had, then you, um, it was basically a pulley system. You laid on the floor, and you could move your arms this way, and your legs, you know, I think I bought it for like $3.50. Um, I never did use that thing. I never coordinated enough to be able to do it. Um, but it ended up at the yard sale pretty quickly. Um, so exercise equipment. People are always coming up and asking me what type of exercise equipment would be good for me to buy. Okay? The type of exercise equipment that would be good to buy is something that you're going to use. Okay? Uh, whether it's a treadmill, a rowing machine is a really good device. But if you're not going to use it, um, you'll end up hanging your clothes on it, okay? This is a cell. Um, those little red things in there are called mitochondria, and that's where energy is um, processed. Um, it's a real neat system, and I'm going to talk about it here in just a minute. And let me say this as I get into a little bit of physiology. If it goes over your head, let it go over your head. The most important thing you, um, when you leave here tonight is basically... Do something. Do something, some type of activity. Okay. Um, so the mitochondria are extremely important. Exercise helps to increase the number of those things so that you get more energy. Um, and one of the best ways to increase that um, is by exercise. Okay. Exercise produces more energy. Um, simple heart physiology. If you look at the heart here, um, you've got basically two main vessels um, coming down to, what happens is these vessels um, bring blood to the heart, even though the heart is basically a blood organ. These vessels bring blood to the heart, and it's important to keep those things cleaned, okay? Um, if you look at this vessel here, it's the right coronary artery, the one here is the left coronary artery, it branches, 
and it comes down in the front. It's called the left anterior descending in the back, um, the um, circumflex. Um, I used to work, I've worked for several years in cardiac rehab, um, and I worked with patients, um, and I also worked in pulmonary rehab. A lot of patients would tell me, am I going to get better? You know, um, especially with pulmonary, and I'd say, you know, you're going to be fortunate if you can just maintain your current level of health. In other words, no, you're probably not going to get better. With heart disease, it's a little bit better. It's a lot more hopeful. Um, but one of the key things here, um, if you look at the next slide, <coughs> is whenever the plumbing begins to get corroded and plaque build up, um, you can see here that blood isn't going to flow through there very easily. And what results, um, if you look at this position here, is that you get a blockage. And you can't see it real well, but you can see the color is a little bit different there. Um, I've looked at, auto um, not autopsies, I've looked at, um, my mind just went blank, um, cadavers. And if you look at the heart of a, in a cadaver of a person that died from heart disease, that section there is actually almost black. It's a grayish black. And the reason it's a grayish black is because it's dead. So that person doesn't have any effusion there as far as um, circulation is concerned. Um, the good thing is, if there's a good thing about this, is that there's such thing as collateral circulation. When I was in college some years ago, I'm going to tell you how long ago that was, um, but when I was in college, there was a lot of debate whether there was collateral, collateral circulation that took place in the heart muscle. Um, but through research and new technology and so forth, we see that, yes, indeed, there is collateral circulation. And what happens is, if there's a blockage here, you can see that blockage there, and that tissue that is um, basically dying or dead. Um, and then look at what happens here. You get this extra circulation going on, and that helps to bring oxygen to the muscle tissue. Okay, does it make you whole again? Probably not, but it certainly is beneficial. So anything that's happening in the heart is happening in the rest of your body. Keep that in mind, because a lot of times people think that um, if they've got heart disease, it's only here. But if you've got um, vessels that are beginning to block or are blocked in the heart, you're probably having something systemic through your legs or your arms and so forth maybe even in, in your brain, okay? So it's really important, again, um, exercise and diet, and we can talk about which one is more important. I'm not gonna even go down that road. They're both very important. So the American College of Sports Medicine, as far as exercise is concerned, stated that um, we should be exercising a minimum of three times a week, 150 minutes a week, and that's minimum. Okay, um, I was just reading, uh, um, you know, that would be a, an hour a day, three days a week, or you can figure out however you want to do that. But uh, um, you're going to see coming up here that um, I said that was minimum. It's probably important that you do three to four times that. Well, we're not all in a position where we can spend two or three hours a day exercising, even though that would be beneficial. So my point to you is that get up and do something. I don't care if it's 15 minutes. I talk to my diabetic patients, um, and I encourage them to do two 15-minute sessions, one in the morning and one at night. If they can't, at least get the 15 in, and then we can progress from there, all right? Um, so the definition of exercise, any activity requiring physical effort, effort carried out specifically to sustain and improve health and fitness. Um, it's going to cause an increase in heart rate, lung function, muscular strength and endurance, and guess what? You might even sweat. <laughs> no, <laughs> okay. Um, sweating is part of the deal. That's what showers are for, okay. I'm the workout fairy. I'm here to tighten up your abs. All right, the best exercises, and I've kind of categorized these. Um, every time you move, that's exercise. 
You know, so when somebody says, do you exercise? You can honestly say, yeah, I do, okay? Um, but the amount is gonna become pretty important. So we're gonna look at cardiorespiratory, strength training, flexibility balance, agility, and breathing. Those are all kind of components of exercise. And when we exercise, we wanna consider warming up the activity itself and then cooling down and you warm up. Um, if you walk and you walk at a, a fairly brisk pace, you may want to spend two or three minutes just starting off slowly, but walking. You want your warm-up to be specific to what your exercise is. Um, that's really critical. So if you're doing weight training, um, you just do real light weight just to get the blood going um, and get limber and so forth. We could go down into the weeds on this here. Um, these are the en energy systems. The energy process on how it comes about within your body is really fascinating. There are certain systems that you can train, and I'm not going to go into this um, because we don't need to, but we need to have an understanding that the body is uh, marvelously made. It's, in, it's incredible. Um, it did, just didn't come about. Um, there has to be somebody behind the whole thing. But as you look at this slide, there are certain energy systems. There are energy, there's an energy system for um, when you get out of bed in the morning, for when you pick something up, uh, for when you walk briskly from your kitchen to your bathroom. Um, that's an energy system. And then there's another energy system um, that is kind of a short-term system that um, works for you when you're um, maybe running from your car to your house and it's raining out. All right, um, and then there's the, what we call the oxidative system, that's for uh, long activity, walking briskly for 45 minutes, okay? That's a totally different system in your body than the one that picks up a weight, all right? Um, and, and it's really neat stuff, but I don't think it's necessary for us to talk about it here. So when we talk about exercise, we talk about frequency, intensity, time, and type. <coughs> um, we've mentioned warm-up, um, type of activity, there's aerobic and anaerobic. How many of you have heard those terms before? Okay, aerobic activity are activities that require a constant supply of oxygen to the body where you constantly breathe. Um, can you give me an example of something like that? Walking. Walking is a jogging, swimming. Those are called aerobic activities. An anaerobic activity is an activity that you can basically hold your breath for, complete the activity. Can you give me an example of that? Like lifting weight. Okay, good. Lifting a weight would be called an anaerobic activity. Um, let me ask you a question. How about tennis? There's no right answer for that. I won't belabor the point, but if you're a pro professional tennis player, it's probably an aerobic activity. But if you're like most of us playing tennis, we hit the ball into the net, hit the ball, it goes long, and we walk over to the other side of the tennis court. Toss the ball up, hit into the net. Um, that would probably be an anaerobic activity because it's not continuous. Okay. So in order for it to be an anaerobic activity, it has to use large muscle groups, be rhythmical and continuous, continuous being the key. Um, if it's anaerobic, it's going to be intermittent, and examples of that, short sprints, tennis, as I said, weight training. All right, I handed out a sheet of paper, and we're not going to go over this tonight because it'll just take too much time. But when we, um, when we exercise... Um, and we want to know, is the exercise beneficial enough? We want to get up to a certain level, but not necessarily passing another. So we call that period in between those two points the training zone. And for most of us, somewhere between 60 and 80% of our maximum heart rate is where we should be. Maximum heart rate, if you look up there, is 220 minus your age. Okay, so I'm going to let you take that sheet home tonight and work it out and just see what, where you come out. Um, you don't have to be a math wizard to figure that out. Get your calculator, calcul calculator out, and you can figure out that training zone. Um, 
Having said that, <laughs> don't worry about your training heart rate zone. Just get out and do it. Um, when I was at Brigham Young University working on my uh, doctorate, um, I was curious, so I went out to, at noontime to this field we had by the field house. It was huge. And people would take their lunch breaks and jog around there. And I would stop a person and take their heart rate. Then I'd stop another and ask them their age. Then I'd stop another person. Most people exercise at 70 to 80 percent of their maximum heart rate because that's a comfortable place to be. Okay, and if if you look like deer in the headlights right now, don't worry about it. But um, that's a comfortable place to be, whether you're in really good shape or whether you're in bad shape. That's why the um, the case study that Rhoda mentioned at Naperville um, in Illinois um, is so critical because if you're heavy and you're, you're walking slow, your heart rate still moving pretty good. It's probably moving 70 to 80 percent. If you're physically fit and you're moving really quickly, it's still probably 70 to 80 percent. It just means that if you're physically fit, you're more efficient. You can do more than what the person that is not physically fit able to do, okay? Um, so you can get just as much benefit being physically unfit until you get fit as the person that is already physically fit. Does that make sense? I see some head shaking. <laughs> so go um, do this and just play around with it. Um, there are two books that I want to share with you tonight. One is Spark. And that's the one that the uh, case study from um, the time's flying by. Um, that's the case study that uh, Rhoda mentioned at the very beginning tonight um, with the school system and the increase in uh, grades, um, academic performance as far as math and reading is concerned, also a ACT scores. Five points on ACT is an incredible difference. Um, ask my son, okay? Um, you can take that test over and over again and, and be somewhere around 22, 23, um, and the person that scores 28 or 30, uh, that's a big difference. Okay, so that study is an incredible study that w that's going on. Um, we mentioned the Naperville Central High School thing. Um, so let's, let's look at some of the other things that um, this book talks about. And I'm going to leave this book up here so you can come and, um, if you're interested in it, it's a great read. I mean, it's, it's easy reading. Uh, you can understand it. You don't have to be a scientist to do that. Um, Rady is a, a psychologist, by the way. Um, BMI and aerobic fitness are significant markers for academic performance. Um, there are three key... Um, neurotransmitters in the brain. Um, and you're probably familiar with a couple of these things. Um, if you've got Parkinson's or Alzheimer's or you work with those type of people, uh, these three neurotransmitters are really important. And they're secreted right in the brain, pituitary gland and uh, the hippocampus. Uh, one is um, serotonin, it's for mood, it's also for sleep. Some of you may take serotonin to sleep well at night. Another one is norepinephrine. It's to help us get focused. So norepinephrine is secreted um, when we hit a fight or flight situation. Okay, you're walking down a dark alley, somebody jumps out in front of you, you decide you're gonna stand there and fight or you're gonna run, okay? That's when norepinephrine comes in. Um, and then the last one is dopamine and I think Many of you have heard of dopamine. It's a reward system. It's the thing that's secreted that makes you feel good and want to go back and do that activity. Um, it's an addictive neurotransmitter, but it's also an extremely beneficial one. So if you look at those, um, serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine, um, just think about the potential those neurotransmitters have in uh, Alzheimer's disease and in Parkinson's. 
and exercise helps to push that in the brain. So that's why exercise is so critical, even when you're not feeling good. It's critical to get those things going in your brain. These, just a slide I threw up there um, to show you the um, neurons in the brain, the axons and dendrites, those things that look like roots. Um, exercise helps to enhance the number of neurons in the brain as well as building the pathways. Um, and so again, for Alzheimer's and um, Parkinson's, exercise is so critical. And you don't need to be doing exercise at 90% of your maximum heart rate or 80%. You just need to be moving to get the benefits. Um, I'm going to skip through some of this stuff. Um, there is one thing here, brain-derived neurotropic factor, BDNF. Um, it's a protein in the brain um, that helps to build neurons and the neural pathways. So when you exercise, it helps to increase the amount of BDNF in your brain. And that's a tremendous benefit because ultimately that again helps in the, um, with the neurotransmitters, norepinephrine, serotonin, and dopamine. And then there are um, a couple of hormones that play a key role. HGH is home, uh, human growth hormone. Um, it's a hormone that's secreted, and um, especially when we're young, say, from the time we're born until we're um, 19 or 20. Okay, it kind of decreases and almost disappears after 20, um, but it's very beneficial in um, increasing the amount of BDNF in the brain. And so exercise increases the amount of BDNF which also helps your neurotransmitters um, and just increases your ability to think. And so again, that's another reason why exercise is so important for the Alzheimer's and Parkinson's patient. Um, and also for the diabetic. And we're gonna skip through some of this. Um, there is also another book here um, called Body by Science. Um, <laughs> it's a very interesting book. Um, it basically talks about high-intensity interval training. When you go out and do your walk, um, you want to challenge your body, and it doesn't matter whether you're, you're walking this fast or you're really at a pretty good clip. You want to challenge yourself and vary your workout. Your body kind of gets used to what it's doing, and you don't get that benefit that you could get if you began doing what we call interval training. So, um, my wife and I walk in the morning or in the evening. Um, we're past the age where we want to run six miles a night. Um, but we, <laughs> Curtis, but we do um, fairly rapid walking. Um, but we don't do fairly rapid walking the whole time we're walking the three or four miles that we do. Um, what we'll do is we'll jog to a telephone pole and then we'll walk a little bit to the next telephone pole and then we'll jog to the next pole. That's interval training and it's extremely, um, extremely good. So when you do your walking, you can vary your walking and you can use telephone poles, you can use 20 seconds, um, you can do uh, whatever you want to do, but vary your workout if you're walking or running um, you know, I think about marathon runners. I've run seven marathons, and I don't, at least as I got into marathon running, um, I didn't just run. Um, I did interval training sometimes. Because I, remember those energy systems, the aerobic one, long, long time, shorter ones? You want to build those systems, because overall they're going to help that BDNF that we just talked about. Um, there was an interesting study there, but we don't have time to really talk about it. Um, so how about beta blockers? Um, I was talking to um, someone here a minute ago about um, atrial fib, and I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand if you have it or had it. Um, atrial fib, we've gotten to a point in society where it seems like almost everybody has atrial fib at one, you know, some point in their life. Um, I see it so much. Um, when I used to teach college 20 years ago, 
Um, atrial fib was fairly rare, so you know, I, I hope they're doing studies now to figure out why it's so prevalent. Maybe we just know how to see it and treat it, I don't know. Um, but it seems like a lot of people have atrial fib. Um, that shouldn't prevent you from exercising. Uh, again, you want to talk to your doctor. Um, if you're on a beta blocker, and that's usually a medication that ends in OL, sotalol, atenolol, um, metoprolol, those medications are going to lower your heart rate. So you're not going to be able to use this sheet that I gave you to figure out your heart rate. Um, so an, a, a good way to do it is use the scale, what we call um, rate of perceived exertion. Just ask yourself, how hard am I working? And we use this in cardiac rehab all the time. Um, and for, for you when you're walking, um, you're probably going to be in this area, light intensity to moderate intensity, so somewhere between three and six. All right? You're not going to probably be up in this area here because that's high intensity interval training area. Okay? And I've talked about high intensity interval training just so that you know what that is. Um, but most of you probably aren't going to be doing that. But that doesn't mean you can't be doing the interval training that I mentioned going from pole to pole. Um, there's another type of um, chart that you can use. Um, again, you see where HIIT, high in uh, intensity interval training is. It's way up at the top. So frequency, how often should you exercise? Um, it depends on what you're doing. But there's nothing wrong with exercising daily for that 15 to 45 minutes. Um, five, I think, five days a week is ideal. Um, once you get down to three or four, if you miss a day, um, <laughs> you're what I call a weekend warrior. You do your training, you get sore. You don't exercise for three days. You do your training, you get sore. Um, that's not the way you want to be doing it. This is the study that I talked about. It just came out here um, not that long ago. Um, we talked about the minimum of three to five days a week, uh, 150 minutes a week of walking. Um, this is saying that you could do that three or four times as much to get real benefit. Okay? Most of us don't have that kind of time, and I don't want you to get discouraged thinking about that. Recovery time is your fitness indicator. The quicker you recover from your walking, the better fit you are. If you're not fit, it's going to take you a, much longer to recover. Um, muscular tr strength training is a good idea. <laughs> strength training is a good idea. Uh, we're going to demonstrate some things here in just a few minutes. Um, And there are some examples of strength training, um, not the picture. <laughs> if you're doing strength training, for instance, you have a dumbbell, um, you want to breathe out on the effort phase, and as you relax, breathe in. Okay? That's really critical because you don't want that pressure to build up in your chest, uh, especially if you have AFib or some other things going on with you. Flexibility, we as older adults don't think about flexibility, but flexibility is extremely important. Staying flexible are going to prevent injuries, prevent falls, um, and there's some things that you can do flexibility-wise. Usually if you're doing a strength training exercise, you're kind of including flexibility in there. This is my mom. I wish I had that kind of flexibility. No, it's not my mom. But. And then cooling down is important too. The core, we refer to the core as this portion of the body. And this is important to keep strong, extremely important. Um, I'm going to demonstrate a couple of exercises to you. Um, again, if you have low back problems, um, or any type of physical issues, you may want, not want to do those. Uh, and I think you can see me if I'm over here. How many of you know what a Kegel is? 
Kegel exercises are extremely important because they strengthen the pelvic floor in this area. Um, a Kegel, um, if I can say it without being gross, um, if you, um, uh, I'll say it, if you're peeing and you tighten up to stop the front and squeeze your butt, that's called a Kegel exercise. Okay, I got it out. Uh, so you would, you'd sque what you're doing is you're pulling in the front and pulling in the back, and it strengthens a muscle in the abdomen area called the transverse abdominis. Um, that muscle is also called the cummerbund. How many of you know what a cummerbund is? Okay. Yeah, you haven't been to too many proms and too many dances and haven't worn too many tuxedos, evidently. It's that thing that goes around your waist and it, it keeps it in, okay? And extremely important for low back issues. So um, you do your Kegel exercise and you can do your Kegel exercise while you're doing some of these exercises. Matter of fact, you can do them no matter what exercise you're doing. You're not holding your breath, but you are tightening up this area. So planks are really good exercises, but again, if you have any physical disabilities and you want to stay away from these, do the Kegels, because they do strengthen this area. So on the plank, the easiest one to do is on the knee and on the elbow, and you're just holding this position. And you can hold it for five seconds, 10 seconds, 20, you'll build up. Okay. As you get stronger, you can go up to your arms and do it, and I'm still doing the Kegel, or you can go up to this position. Um, I don't recommend this one particular because it does place a stress on your lower back. Okay. But planks are really pretty good, especially that first one I showed you with the Kegel exercise. And as I say, it strengthens that abdominal area for the transverse abdominis. Anybody rebound here? Got some here. Rebounding is a great exercise. Remember we talked about the um, lymphatic system? Um, and also the... Um, What's the other system that takes trash out of our lymphatic system? Thank you. Okay. Um, rebounding is really good for uh, moving that lymphatic fluid out of the body so that um, the kidneys and liver can take care of the trash that's in there and eliminate it. Some of the benefits are shown here. It, it stimulates the inner organs, improves eyesight. How many of you thought that um, rebounding could improve eyesight. Good. As you're rebounding and you're looking at a particular spot, you're moving, it strengthens the eyes. Okay. Um, it increases agility, reduces body fat, and the list is there. Um, there are a lot of things. This is a rebounder here for those of you that haven't ever tried one. Um, some of them have bars that come up so you can hold it for stability. Um, I would recommend that if you haven't been doing a lot of rebounding. But just simply bouncing like this increases your circulation, gives you muscle tone. You can even do a Kegel here, okay? Um, you can hold your arms out, and gravity forcing down on your arms will help build muscle, muscle strength in your shoulders. You can do twists as you're doing these. Okay. And I think probably the best type of twisting isn't where you go cranking around like that, but where you leave your hips facing forward and, and do your stretch that way. Um, you can run on this thing. Um, but again, uh, if you don't have really good balance, having that bar is a, is a good thing. Um, this is a fairly expensive rebounder. And you can tell because the elastic bands are there. Um, we have one that we use. It's got metal springs. 
and when I'm in work and I can hear ka-choo, 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 okay? So if you want something that's quiet, um, you wanna make sure you get the ones with the elastics. Um, something just popped into my head. When we were talking about um, human growth hormone, um, you know, it's prevalent when we're born until we're about 20. Um, there's a, um, I can't remember what it's called, something lipase, and what it does is it opens the blood vessels in your skin, and I mentioned before that that's one of the reasons why some people look so young when they're 60, 70 years old, because they're exercising and, and they're getting that benefit. The leg muscles are your second heart. In other words, leg muscles contract and push blood back to the heart. That's one of the main ways it gets there because by the time blood is down in our lower extremities, um, the pressure from the heart pumping um, doesn't do as much good as up in the upper thoracic area. Um, so walking and getting those leg muscles moving, it's like milking a cow. It gets that blood back up to the heart. Um, as far as chair exercises are concerned, I do this with our diabetics because a lot of our diabetics are five foot two, 280 pounds, 320 pounds. Um, and so we'll do chair exercises. And this some there, some of those are more extreme than what you probably want to be doing again. You want to be careful um, depending on what your physical status is. Um, you don't want to be doing anything that's going to hurt your spinal column. And that's why you want to talk to your doctor on some things um, or see a physical therapist. But there are some simple things. You can just lift your legs out alternately. And <clears throat> what we do is um, sets and repetitions. So each time I lift this, it's a repetition. So we may do six to eight repetitions, and then we'll relax, and we'll do six to eight repetitions. When we've completed that six to eight repetitions on both legs, that's one set. And so you may start off just doing one set and then build up to two sets and then three sets. Um, you can bring your leg up, bring it out, bring it back and put it down. And bring your leg out, move it to the side. Uh, you can do side stretches, again, depending on uh, the condition of your spinal column. You can do twists. Um, and you can do things with your neck, too. Um, any questions on chair exercises? You can, you can just Google chair exercises and, and find a, a lot of them, um, and there'll be a lot that you can do. So um, on a rainy day, you can't get outside. Chair exercise is a good way to go. And then how many of you have used bands? Yeah, that's probably because you've been in physical therapy at the hospital, right? <laughs> Okay, with the band, um, bands come in different colors, and the colors um, tell you what strength the band is. This is an average one, it's green. You can take the band like this around your hand and just pull out. The shorter the band, the more difficult the exercise is going to be. So if you leave a little bit more there, it's a little bit easier. Okay. You can take the band, step on it, go back here. <laughs> There's probably a lot of you um, that can't get your arm in that position. <laughs> but if you can, this is a good exercise for the triceps. Okay, so what is it each, what do we call it each time I move it? It's a repetition. Okay, and I do six to eight of those, and then I move over to the other side, okay? You can take the band, wrap your hand around it, get caught in my mic cord, and do curls. And it's gonna help your bicep. Whenever you strengthen one side of a, um, a limb, you wanna strengthen the other side. Same thing with the legs. Um, we have a tendency to have real strong uh, quadricep muscles and weaker um, back muscles of the back thigh, okay? Um, so there's a lot of things you can do with a, uh, a band like this. I'm going to be giving some things away um, before we leave tonight. 
uh, don't have something for everybody. These things are somewhat expensive. Um, but there's a lot you can do with those. The nice thing about a band, I mean, um, this here is that you can stick it in your suitcase and go somewhere. I mean, it doesn't take up any room whatsoever. How many of you have a smartwatch? Almost seems like most people have them today. Uh, you can get a lot of information for that. It's a motivator, um, just like a pedometer is. Um, I know at the end of the day, if I don't have so many steps in, I'll go outside and walk up and down my driveway until I get to where I want to be. Um, and you can set your goal that way. 2,000 steps is a process approximately one mile. 2,000 steps is approximately one mile. So if you're using a smartwatch or a pedometer, um, and don't get into, well, his steps are longer than my steps, and you know, so he's really getting uh, more steps because his steps are shorter. 2,000 steps is about a mile, okay? Safety concerns, um, you wanna have good clothing, uh, stay hydrated. Um, I had a whole thing here on how to buy walking shoes. When I was at, in graduate school at Brigham Young, um, I wanted my parents to exercise. So I foot the bill for a pair of walking shoes for both of them. And they did really well for a year. But I got discouraged when I'd go home and my father would be out rototill in the garden in his walking shoes. Okay, Take your walking shoes, Use them for walking and then use your other shoes for whatever you're gonna do. Your walking shoes will last you longer um, and after a period of time you have to replace them anyway. But you don't wanna be rototilling your garden, uh, especially up in New England where that nice black soil is um, with that. Recommendations, uh, again, vary your exercise routine. I know everybody here that exercises probably goes out and walks 15 minutes or three miles or two miles a day. Vary that and you'll get much more benefit. I challenge you to do that, whether it's telephone poles or every 20 seconds picking it up and then slowing it down, um, that's good. And that's called interval training. Um, listen to your body, as I said, um, and I've mentioned most of those. So how many calories do you burn when you walk? There's about 3,500 calories in a pound of body fat. When you walk a mile, how many calories do you think you burn? Throw out some numbers. 75, 200, somewhere between 100, 150. Okay. Um, and it doesn't really matter you know, <laughs> which is kind of discouraging if you just look at it from that perspective. 100 calories per mile and 3,500 calories per pound of fat. But the fact is that when you walk, you burn that 100 calories plus your metabolic rate stays extended, so you're gonna be burning a lot more than 100 calories. Um, so don't let that discourage you. And not only that, um, exercise, walking, and so forth isn't so much for weight loss as much as it is for weight maintenance. Okay, so keep that in mind. And there's a lot of ways to incorporate um, exercise in your program. So what fits your busy schedule better, exercising one hour a day or being dead 24 hours a day? Okay, that's really, really not so funny, but I thought I'd throw it in there anyway. Um, a few parting words of wisdom, 1 Corinthians 6, 19, 20. Do, not, do you not know that your body is a temple of the living of the Holy Spirit? who is in you, whom you have received from God. You are not your own, you are bought with a price, therefore honor God with your bodies. There's an old quote, Arabian quote, he who has health has hope, and he who has hope has everything. So, if your dog is fat, you're probably not getting enough exercise. Okay, get out there and walk your dog. And that's it. Um, I've got my son here. Um, he's finishing up his degree in physical therapy at Andrews University. Um, and that's why I think that physical therapists play such a key role 
and our health. Um, when it comes to exercise and body function, they're about as knowledgeable as anybody. Um, and so if you have any questions, just raise your hand. We'll try to answer them really quickly. Patty? Okay, the question is, when you exercise and you're sore, um, how do you know whether it's just not sore from the exercise or whether you're injured yourself? Okay, um, you wanna take that one? Yeah, I can take that one. So the best thing you can do is if you're sore for about two days and then after that you're fine, that's kind of what you're looking for, right? You should be able to recover in about 48 hours. That's why when you do a certain muscle group, you train that muscle group, right? Say you, you're doing, I like to do push muscle groups, so like push-ups, triceps, chest, right? And I'll wait two days for that to recover, right? And, and, and then the next day, right, grab the um, firm. Yeah, this one here. All right. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Is that better? <laughs> so. What I was saying was, it's about 48 hours for muscles to recover. So when you're training a muscle group, you want to give those muscles two, two days to recover, right? And so if you're doing like a day where you're doing a lot of one specific muscle group, give it two days. Um, maybe even if it's, if it's running, right? You want to run a 5K or that's your goal or, or even just run a mile. You want to give those muscles about two days to recover. And then that's when you can train them again. Yeah, yeah. Well, if, if, yeah, say you're hurting for three days, four days, or a week, God forbid, you know, that's, that's when you want to try and take it a little easier next time you're doing that and continue to build up, right? So cut back on maybe the amount of reps that you're doing, cut back on the time that you're running and, or the, the time that you're trying to run the mile and make it a little longer. Make it easier in some way so that you're sore for two days and then you're okay after that, yeah. And if there's swelling in any joint or anything, just back off. There's no need to push yourself. And by the way, the um, soreness that comes from doing push-ups or any type of weight activity or even walking um, is a result of micro tears in the muscle fiber. Mm -hmm. And that's why Ryan says in two days, three days, those, that should repair itself and actually become stronger. So you won't get that soreness again. Yeah. Uh, good question. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Any other questions? Just wondering, how is, is it that a great exercise? <laughs> it's a great cardio exercise, yeah. yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Is swimming a good exercise? And it is a good cardio exercise. Um, it is a non-gravity exercise because you're buoyed up in the water. Um, I know a few years ago there was a lot of debate whether a person should swim or jog or do some other cycle. Um, but yeah, swimming is a good exercise. Any exercise that you're going to stick with and do is a good exercise. Yeah, find something that you can enjoy, that you can be consistent with, right? That's really what matters at the end of the day is, is being consistent and finding something that, you know, you walk away from it feeling like you've accomplished something that, that you, you know, that you're attached to that exercise. That's, that's a great way to build a habit, really. Can you explain why the benefits of HIIT training physiologically are better? Yeah, HIIT training, the question is, why is HIIT training so good? And it's because it pushes our energy systems, those three energy systems that we had a picture of, it pushes that and pushes it and pushes it. So it gives you benefits that you're not gonna get by just walking, okay? That's okay. Not all of us here are at an age where we're gonna go out and do exercise at 90% of our maximum heart rate. Remember we're talking about heart rates and so forth. So that's what HIIT training is. I'd rather refer you to interval training where you just pick up your speed. You don't necessarily get up to that 90% or 85%. Um, 
And I know some of you probably aren't following me or tracking me on that. Um, but they used to say, just go out <coughs> exercise so that you can carry on a conversation. We now know that that's good, but there's something better, and that's pushing yourself periodically, changing up your exercise routine, uh, maybe from walking to cycling to um, some other type of cardiovascular activity, rowing. Rowing's a great um, activity. But yeah, most of us aren't gonna be able to get into a real high intensity interval training type thing that HIT talks about, okay? But if you can, it's, it's good for you to do. I mean, you can stand there for 30 seconds and then relax for three minutes and then do that again, relax for three minutes and do that a third time. And that is equivalent according to a study that I was looking at up at McMaster University in uh, Canada, um, that's equivalent to walking 45 minutes. So you spend 97.5% uh, less time exercising but getting the same benefit. And I think we're gonna learn a lot more about that as time goes on. So, Rhoda? I'm sorry? Yes. Remember, remember what I said? Uh, maybe you weren't in here yet. Whenever we move, we exercise. The thing about gardening is that while it may be anaerobic, we're not moving continuously, the benefit to us mentally, being outside in God's nature and seeing things grow, I believe that's extremely important for health. So yeah, um, we, when I was in college, we used to get into this argument, it, matter of fact, it was denominational in our church, that is gardening worth walking or jogging or whatever, okay? It's all good, just do it. I think it's important too to have variety, right? So finding something that you can enjoy, like I said before, but that you can have multiple things that you enjoy, right? and trying to do those on a regular basis each week so that you're not just doing HIIT, you're not just doing strength training, you're not just doing cardio. You're getting cardio in, right, five days a week, but you should be getting in addition to that, you should be doing strength training and putting some strain on your muscles, joints, bones. It's good for your, your bone density to be doing that, right? Um, and having variety will really provide that benefit. Which brings up to one maybe last thing that I didn't mention. Breathing is an exercise, and it's an important exercise. And there is what we call a nine, seven, eight type of breathing that everybody can do and should be doing. We do a Kegel and hold it, and then we breathe in for four seconds fully with our hands just slightly touching our chest. Now let's try it. As you sit there, kind of move to the front of your pew, not back here. We're gonna put our hands here. We're gonna, let me um, go through it first, <laughs> okay? We're gonna breathe in fully, as much as we can breathe in, and we're gonna hold it for seven seconds while we're doing a Kegel. And then we're gonna let it out, but we're gonna let it out as our stomach collapses. Still doing the Kegel. Now we're gonna breathe in four seconds. Hold it seven. Still doing the Kegel. And then relax the stomach muscles. And that actually strengthens that muscle we were talking about, the cummerbund muscle, the transverse abdominis. And you can do that, um, I don't know, Ryan, what would you say, six times, five times? Yeah, just throughout the day, I think it's important to um, really focus on when you're breathing out, pulling your belly button into your spine, that's when you should be doing that Kegel. Um, and it, it'll activate that muscle that's, that cages in your spine and provides support to your spine. And that's extremely important because um, 
as you pull your stomach in and the air comes out and you're doing the Kegel, um, you're actually strengthening the core. And <laughs> I can't tell you, this is, I think, one of the, I, I've just learned about this. Ryan brought it to my attention. Um, it's something that everybody should be doing because it does strengthen the core muscles. And it, um, as we get older, we put on more weight. The pelvis has a tendency to come forward. We get that belly, okay? Um, and what happens is it, it gives us low doses in a way. It's curvature of the lower spine that you don't, you want some curvature there because it's natural, but you don't want the stomach to be, have weak muscles and let your belly pull the lower portion of your back. So the four, seven, eight breathing, um, as Ryan said, you can do that five or six times, then at noontime do it another. Whenever you're free and you have nothing to do, sit there and do the four, seven, eight breathing with the Kegel on the um, expiration, and you'll find that it helps to strengthen this area. It's really it's, good It's also a really good way to relax. If you're stressed or you have anxiety or anxiety attacks, it's a good way to kind of decompress, to clear your mind and just find, a, find some peace, really. Um, it's just a great way to do that. Um, even if you're having a hard time falling asleep, doing that will help you relax and fall asleep. Yeah. Let me go to here. I can put you in touch with, um, do you know Walt Cross? Yeah. Okay, talk to Walt because he orders them, and he can tell you what the bre um, best brand is. You can pay anywhere from 125 up to probably three or $400. They're, they're pricey, but they're good. Oh, I'm sorry. The, the question, question is, where can you, what, you know, what are the best rebounders? Um, where can you go to get them? Can you order them online? The answer is yes to all those. Um, but Walt Cross, he's a member of our church here for those that are not members. He has a store down in Newport called the Mustard Seed, um, and he has a lot of health food stuff, and he does sell rebounders. Yeah, it's a good question. When should you exercise? Um, let me start off with the when should you exercise. Some people say, should I exercise in the morning, at night? You exercise when you um, can do it. Um, but I think you should be consistent in doing it, otherwise you're not gonna do it. Okay, if you're a morning person, do it in the morning. If you're a evening person, do it in the evening. As far as um, food in your stomach, whenever you eat, blood's gonna go to your stomach. And so you're not likely to get cramps and things. You know, I know as a kid, don't go swimming for 30 minutes after you eat or whatever. Um, but you're not going to be comfortable if you've got food in your stomach, okay? And your circulation is going to be impaired. So I would wait at least at 30 minutes, maybe even an hour after you eat um, to do your exercise, especially if it's intense. Um, if it's just a slow walk, it could actually enhance digestion. So it depends on how intense your exercise is. Kegel. Kegel. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Working on that transverse abdominus with that breathing where you're pulling your, your belly button into your spine, activating that muscle while doing a Kegel um, is really helpful. And if you're having issues with that, a, a great person to see is a pelvic floor physical therapist. That, that is a specialty in physical therapy that's really growing right now um, for, for women that have had pregnancies and had issues from that or just not. You, you know, some, a lot of people have issues with incontinence, and um, it's kind of a taboo thing. It's not talked about a lot, but they're a great person to see regarding that. Um, DJ Floyd? Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, if you have additional questions, we'll stick around for a few minutes. Um, I hope that as we've talked about exercise tonight, you have a little bit of an idea of how we got to where we're at, 
um, a little bit of the physiology behind it, the benefits, um, and the fact that for those of you that have exercise programs, I hope we've opened up a little bit of um, the world to you as far as some additional things you can do that will be very beneficial and that you vary your routines. Don't just get in a rut of doing three miles of walking every day. Okay, there's a lot of things you can do to vary that routine. Um, thanks so much for coming out. I hope that you've learned something, that, um, that we've helped you out a little bit. Get out and be active. I don't care how old you are, what your disability is, um, you can only get a benefit from getting out and doing something. Oh, um, we have a few things we want to give away before you leave. Um, the first thing, this is called Creation Health, and it's all the DVDs. Um, this thing is probably valued at 80 to 100 dollars. Um, I've had a couple of extra copies around the house, um, and so we want to give this away tonight to some lucky winner. <laughs> Kitty Stewart. Hey, cool. front row. <laughs> I hope you have a DVD player. <laughs> <laughs> The second one is um, a Creation Health book. Um, its value is about $25, $30. A lot of good health information and stories in here. All right. Lance Henderson. <laughs> Congratulations, Lance. All right, an exercise band. Mark McGrath. Another exercise band. Cindy, do you have a Cindy? You bet. Oops. Another, another exercise band. Merle and Elaine Bradenberg. There we go. <laughs> so when you go to the wall. Yeah. <laughs> Pat Swanson. Ooh, two winners in one row. <laughs> I like Doris Hayes. You're welcome. Yeah, I can. All right, we're going to send you off. Let's have prayer before we leave. Father in heaven, we pause to thank you for the many blessings that you give us. Um, for the fact that when you created us, you created us perfect. Um, we've fallen away from that. But we know that there are things we can do to keep us healthy. And I pray that each person here tonight, um, if they're not doing some type of activity, that they'll begin. Um, I've heard that there's no such thing as bad weather, just improper clothing. And I pray that um, as we move into spring and uh, can enjoy the weather that uh, we'll get out and uh, do an activity that will be beneficial for us, whether it's um, just starting something or uh, altering what we're doing um, so that we get more benefit. Um, but I pray that your Holy Spirit will guide us. Thank you for the time we've spent together here tonight and for being with us. Amen. If anyone is interested in doing a walking program um, here at the church, come and see myself or Ruth, Ruth Kamineski. <laughs>